Uh, well, let's just get started. The nice thing about today, I'm looking forward to today, there's nothing new. It's just kind of reviewing what we've covered in the previous two lectures. That is the milli equivalence and the conversion from milligram to millimole to milli equivalent and milliosmol. And I thought to myself, well, this is going to be a waste of time and maybe this since half the class last any, left anyways. But here's the deal. That's why I'm not sure this is a waste of time because here is, do you recognize that slide? So this is your question from the pop quiz from last time on Mele equivalence, half the class missed it. Literally half of the class missed this question. Half of it got it perfectly right, but you guys are awesome. You can do something else for the next five minutes. So, but anyways, but I'm still worried again. I'm, the, what I can do is try to help the half of you that aren't getting it or didn't quite get it right. Look at the spread. What you see below, all of those numbers down below, they're all the different answers that I got. The correct answer was 46. So, some of these, let me go through it, and again, this is the same kind of review of what I'm trying to do in this lecture. So, again, some of you have got this. That's great. So, what I want to spend today on is trying to make sure that the other half of the class gets it so that you will do okay on the test, that you need to understand some of this stuff. So, let me read the question. It says, how many milli... Oh. Okay, there we go. All right. How many milli equivalents of calcium are contained in 3.4 grams of calcium chloride dihydrate with the formula given there and the molecular weight given there. Round your final answer. So all I wanted to know was the number of milliequivalents of calcium in 3.4 grams of calcium chloride dihydrate. So clearly what I started off with is the weight of the calcium chloride. All right, and I know I don't keep saying dihydrate, but at this point we're still in the dihydrate. So there's my weight. Where did that come from? That came from right here. So that's what I'm starting with. All right. So what I needed to do is then convert from grams to milligrams. So that's why I multiplied by a thousand just to go from grams to milligrams. So far so good. You can go from grams to milligrams by multiplying by a thousand. See the units cancel. Then this is the important part. This is one step that we're doing a lot in this section is to convert from the weight of a thing to the number of those things. So let me just uh, I try to think of an example here. Let's just say over here I've got 10 students. And on this side over here I've got 10 students. Do I have the same number of students? I have the same number of students. If I put all of those students on a scale, God forbid, would they weigh the same? So students are students, but not all students weigh the same. Does that make sense? So there's a conversion here from the weight of a thing to the number of those things, to the counting of those things. And a millimole, a mole is a counting. It's a number of the things. We don't care about weight. We, there's no difference about weight at that point. When we've converted from weight to millimoles, we're counting. We're no longer at weight. All right. How do you convert from the weight of a thing to the number of those things is by dividing by the molecular weight. So again, the molecular weight of calcium chloride dihydrate is 147. So I converted my milligrams to the number of millimoles, which is a measure of the number of those particles or the number of those molecules by dividing by the formula weight. Okay, now I'm in millimoles, but this is, again, I think we're a big part, to be honest with you, I think these two sections are probably what's messing up people more than anything else. Okay, so let's make sure you understand the difference between those little parts of the brackets, all right? So, I'm in millimoles, the number of mo the parent molecules, the calcium chloride dihydrates. I have a number of molecules of those. But I don't, for chemical activity, I want the chemical activity of just the calcium. So I need to count the calciums. So to count only calciums, I have to look at the formula. So I can circle any one of these. And if I come back over here and circle this one here, what is the formula for that? How many calciums? There's one calcium plus two and one, or no, no, I messed that up here, two chloride minus, okay? So would you agree in that particle there's one calcium and two chlorides? So down below here, I for every one molecule of that, I can cancel that and say that there is just one molecule of calcium in calcium chloride. There's only one of these in the parent molecule. So that's why there's one millimole of calcium for every one millimole of calcium chloride. Setting it up this way allows me to cancel my calcium chlorides. Now I'm just in the number, it's still millimoles, it's still the number of those calcium molecules, I'm just counting the number of molecules. All right? 
So now let's get to this section here. What is the difference with this? This is the amount of chemical activity. This has to do with how much electricity is generated from those molecules. All right. If I had 10 sodium molecules, how much electricity would I get? 10 charges. All right. But calcium has a valence of plus 2. Since it has a valence of 2, it provides two things of electricity for every one molecule. Two charges for every one molecule. So I get two milli equivalents from every one millimole. If we're counting calcium for every one calcium, I get two electrical charges. So that way these units cancel. Well, this is a multicolored mess going here, but anyways, and you're in milli equivalents. If you multiply all the way across, then you'd get 46.26. All right. So you all seem like you're following along okay. What's interesting though, and I've tried to dissect a little bit in terms of where some, this is a, a pretty interesting wrong answer. This 12 comes from simply doing that upside down. If you divide by two at that point, instead of multiply by two, you're essentially dividing your final answer there by four. So that would have given you the 12. So some people who got the wrong answer didn't multiply by two to convert from millimoles to milliequivalents, they divided by two. And so that's why I'm a big proponent of setting up your work and looking at your units before you do any math. Make sure you're canceling the right units and that'll put your numbers on the top or on the bottom. Okay, so uh, anyways, and I won't keep belaboring that point unless you guys have questions for me on that one. That seem okay? All right, well, let's go on some, you're going to see a lot of the same kinds of calculations, and this is supposed to be a review, which, again, for those of you who have got it, then it's just confirmation, but those of you that don't, see if it makes sense. I'll try to go through a little bit slower just because it is a review, and the people who might need it might benefit from me going a little slower. So it says, this question, a physician orders magnesium sulfate to be administered at a rate of 50 milliliters per hour to a patient experiencing premature labor. And actually, magnesium sulfate is used a lot in labor and delivery to help early contractions. It's kind of a smooth muscle relaxant. So again, that's we'll send it up to labor and delivery. The pharmacy sends up a 50 milliliter vial of a 4% solution. And I give you some information there about magnesium sulfate, heptahydrate, and the molecular weight. All right, so the first question says, how many milliequivalents per hour of magnesium will this patient receive? Okay, milliequivalents per hour, is that a rate, a certain amount over a certain amount of time? Would you agree? So that is a rate. Were we given a rate in the question? We were given a rate in the question. It starts here. We were given a rate here, but that's not in milliequivalents per hour, that's in what? milliliters per hour. So the best place to start with this question is with that rate. All we need to really do is change the units. We have 50 milliliters per hour. I want my units to be in milliequivalents per hour. So my hour's already there. All I have to do is convert my milliliters into milliequivalents. And let's do that one step at a time, all right? So starting with the 50 milliliters per hour, and that's where that came from right there. What can I do is use the concentration to convert from a volume to a weight, that is to an actual amount of magnesium sulfate, all right? So what does a 4% mean? 4% weight per volume means 4 grams per 100 milliliters. So I set it up that way so that if I multiply times 4 grams over 100 mils, milliliters cancel. So my first conversion was to convert the volume per hour, the 50 milliliters, to the weight of magnesium sulfate that would be provided in that hour, okay? So 50 mils would provide this equivalent weight now of magnesium sulfate. So far so good? That's in grams, so my next step was simply to convert grams to milligrams. So all I did was multiply by 1,000 and change my weight from grams to my weight now in milligrams. And I did that so that my next step, and this is an important one again here, my next step is to convert from the weight, now in milligrams, to the count. I want to count the number of particles. I don't care what they weigh. I want to know how many I have. The units of how many are moles or millimoles, all right? So let's convert the weight to the number of molecules. So let's multiply by one millimole of magnesium sulfate over, and let's make sure you know where this came from, the 246 is the molecular weight. That's how you convert from a weight of something to the number of those particles, the counting, is to divide by the molecular weight. So now I get, I'm in millimoles of magnesium sulfate, but I'm in this whole big long molecule here. 
At this point, I know I didn't keep it on listed here, but MS stands for that. All right. So while I know the number of those big parent molecules, since I'm trying to determine the chemical activity of just the magnesium, I need to go to from the parent molecule to just the number of magnesium molecules in the parent. How many magnesiums are in one molecule of magnesium sulfate? One. Would you agree? There's just one. Right here, there is just one magnesium. So the one in front of the millimoles here comes from the fact that there's one magnesium in this parent molecule. Okay, so I'm going to throw the whole molecule. So now I've gone from magnesium sulfate to just magnesium. All right, I have counted the number of magnesium molecules. I know how many there are. But remember, when they go in water, I get an electrical charge. And since the valence on magnesium is 2, therefore I get 2 milliequivalents of magnesium for every molecule. Since it's plus 2, 2 charges for every 1 molecule, I get 2 MEQs for every 1 millimole. Now my millimoles cancel, and if you multiply that all the way across, I get... 16.26 milliequivalents of magnesium, and that was already per hour, and that answers this question in milliequivalents per hour. This was simply just a unit conversion of converting my volume into a weight, a weight into a number of molecules of the parent to the number of molecules of magnesium to the number of milliequivalents. So that's kind of the step by steps to go across. And it's kind of cool, we can check our answer here. I put this label up here for the actual product up here so you can kind of see. We just calculated the same value they got, so we know we did our math right. That was milliequivalents. The other section are milliosmoles. We can't forget milliosmoles. So let's go ahead and answer the next question. It says, what is the osmolarity of this solution? And the units for osmolarity are milliosmoles per liter, right? That's osmolarity is milliosmoles per liter. So where do we start with this question? We're going to start with counting the number of milliosmoles we would have in a liter. So that's why I start with 1,000 milliliters, because I want to know the number of milliosmoles in a liter. That would be osmolarity. So let's start with 1,000 milliliters. If I had 1,000 milliliters, what is the concentration of the 1,000 milliliters I have? Well, the, well, see, this is all messy. Let me, still trying to perfect this. It's so messy. Does somebody else know a faster way to do all this? Maybe some other faculty knows this better than I do. Okay, all right, there we go. So I'm going to start here with 1,000 milliliters. That comes from the liter. So my concentration, I'll remind you, was 4%. So that's where the 4% comes from, 4 grams per 100 mils. My mils cancel. I'm now in the weight of my magnesium sulfate. I'm going to convert from grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Okay, and lastly, I'm going to convert to the number of molecules by multiplying or essentially one millimole over the molecular weight of 246. Okay, now, isn't this entirely the same as this up here? Do you see that those are the same? It's the same process. I essentially started from a weight, whatever weight that I had, and I converted it to milligrams, and I converted from milligrams to millimoles. This step is crucial. You must be able to do those and make sure you know how to do those. All right. Now, what I want to point out is this is where things get a little bit different between milliequivalents and milliosmoles. Even though my number two here in this example is the same, they're not always going to be the same. Remember, we said milliequivalence relates to the valence, right? What does milliosmoles relate to? Where, how do you count the number of milliosmoles? It comes from the particles. You actually have to look at the chemical formula. Okay, so let's look at this thing right here. How many particles, when, that disso when this dissociates in water, okay, when it comes apart, how many particles do you have? There's a magnesium, there's a sulfate, and there are seven waters. So is that nine particles? It's the number of particles in water. Do we have to count the water particles? We, I want to make sure you see, this is a trick. This is, I absolutely understand where this would be kind of tricky on this. If you're going to count the number of particles, it's the number of particles dissolved in water, dispersed in water. So we don't care about the water. So those seven water molecules or the two water molecules for the dihydrates, trihydrates, we don't care about the hydrates. We want the number of things floating in the water, not the water itself. So in this case, if we get rid of the water, because that's not a particle that's going to be floating in the water, then essentially you have one magnesium and one sulfate. Therefore, the answer is two milliosmoles per millimole. Two particles, a magnesium and a sulfate. Two things that are floating around for every molecule of magnesium sulfate. 
Therefore, I'm now in milliosmoles, and I multiply that across, and I get 325 milliosmoles. And once again, if we look up here on our little answer there, we see we calculated the same number. Okay? All right, I'm trying to give you a chance if there's something I can answer. This is an interesting one, I think, because, you know, there's a lot of different calcium supplements out there. There's calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. They're just two examples, and they're supposed to provide a certain amount of calcium each day. But the numbers are different. There's 600 milligram calcium carbonate tablets, and there's like 950 milligram calcium citrate tablets. Do they provide the same amount of calcium? We're going to find out. We're going to calculate that by measuring the milliequivalents. Actually determine the chemical activity in terms of the amount of calcium each supplement provides, each tablet, and let's see if they come out to be the same or if they're different. And I'll give you some of the specifics there. All right? So let's start with the calcium carbonate. And again, the 600 milligram calcium carbonate tablet, so let's start with the weight of a single tablet. All right? Let's convert the weight of that tablet to the number of molecules of calcium carbonate in that tablet. It's kind of cool. We can count the molecules because we were given that the molecular weight for calcium carbonate is 100. All right? So if we take 600 milligrams of calcium carbonate times 1 millimole over 100 milligrams, then my milligrams cancel, and I'm in the number of millimoles of calcium carbonate. But then let's look at this formula right here. How many calciums are in a calcium carbonate molecule? I would argue just one. So there's one there for every parent molecule. So let's multiply by one millimole of calcium for every one millimole of calcium carbonate. So now I'm away from the parent molecule into the specific number of just my calcium molecules. Now I can determine the chemical activity because we said if we look at the valence here, it's a two for calcium. So there would be two milliequivalents of calcium for every molecule of calcium. So now millimoles cancel and I multiply that all the way across and I get 12 milliequivalents of calcium. Okay? Hope this is easy. Let's do the same thing for the calcium citrate now. So if I take 950 milligrams of my calcium citrate, because that's how much is in a tablet, let's set that up and solve it the same way. However, the molecular weight is different. So I'm going to have to divide it by the molecular weight for the calcium citrate. So 950 milligrams divided by the 498.5 milligrams cancel, and I'm now in molecules of calcium citrate. And I like this one because this one's not as easy. Look here on the formula. The formula says there's how many calciums in this molecule? Three. There are three calciums for every one molecule of calcium citrate. Everyone okay on that? That's, a, that's what we've been doing. It's one and not been obvious, but right now, the formula for calcium citrate is Ca3, then citrate 2. So there are two citrates and three calciums, because calcium is plus 2, citrate is minus 3. So it takes three calciums and two citrates to have the same electrical charge. All right? So because of that, then I can now say there are three calcium molecules for every one molecule of the calcium citrate. So my millimoles of calcium citrate cancel, and I'm in the number of molecules of calcium. Once again, the calcium activity valence is two, so there's going to be two milliequivalents of calcium for every millimole. So millimoles cancel, and if I multiply across, I now get 11.4 versus my 12 that I got from the calcium carbonate. So technically, the answer to this question would be a calcium carbonate has more, but they're essentially the same. They're actually formulated to essentially provide the same amount of calcium two different ways. So which would you recommend? It doesn't matter, right? They provide the same amount of calcium, but again, calcium citrate is thought to be a little bit easier on the stomach, dissolves a little bit easier. So again, there are some patient-specific factors that can help you decide. But essentially, the different numbers are because of the different weights of the salts, but they're both there to provide essentially the same amount of calcium. All right, ready to go on? I like this question because it goes to show you why they actually put the chemical structures in the package insert. That image on the top right for Nexium here is straight out of the package insert for Nexium delayed release oral suspension. If you pull up the package insert, they got a clinical pharmacology section on there. They include the formula because it turns out you can learn some things from that. So let's talk about this one. It's kind of interesting. It says a 40 milligram packet of Nexium delayed release oral suspension actually contains 44.5 milligrams of the salt, which is azomiprazole magnesium trihydrate. So I may call that EMT. EMT stands for azomiprazole magnesium trihydrate. That is the salt form of the drug. Okay. So even though there's only 40 milligrams of the active ingredient, 
the active moiety is 40 milligrams of ezomeprazole. The whole packet, including all of the salt and stuff that it takes to formulate it, has 44.5 milligrams. All right? And the only other information I tell you is that the molecular weight of the EMT, of the parent molecule, is 600 or 767.2. All right? So, first question says, how many millimoles of ezomeprazole are contained in one box containing 30 packets? All right, so let's start on this, and then we're eventually going to have to go back up to our little description here. So let's do this first. We want to know how many millimoles of ezomeprazole, the active moiety, in 30 packets. So let's start with the 30 packets. So I know that you know, I've got 30 packets, and that each packet has 44.5 milligrams of EMT. So if I take 30 packets times 44.5 milligrams of EMT per packet, that's my total weight of the salt. All right. I also know the molecular formula. I know the weight of the EMT salt, so I can divide my weight by that to count the number of molecules. So now I'm in millimoles of uh, EMT, the uh, ezomeprazole magnesium trihydrate, total count. I can count those molecules. But what do I want? I don't want the total molecules. I want the molecules of just the ezomeprazole, not the parent molecule. That's why you got to look at the formula. So let's look up here at this formula. Here, this big gross looking chemical structure that you're going to love in MedCam, that is ezomeprazole. It's a big complicated molecule. Okay? But in the end, with all of those things covalently bound to it, it does, it is, does come apart in solution and it has a negative one charge. There is in the end exposed a negative one charge on ezomeprazole. Okay? Now, this is what I don't know, but for some reason, in terms of the way they formulate it, it works best to combine the ezomeprazole with magnesium. However, what's the valence on magnesium? A positive 2. Therefore, how many ezomeprazole molecules are going to be combined to magnesium? 2. You'll notice down here, there's a 2 in front of that bracket. So, ezomeprazole magnesium trihydrate has 3 water molecules one magnesium molecule, and how many ezomeprazole moieties? Two. It has two, and you wouldn't know that without looking at the chemical structure. So now looking at that structure, when it does dissociate in water and separates from the magnesium, for every one molecule of EMT, the parent molecule, how many ezomeprazoles do I get? I actually get Two, that one parent molecule releases two active moieties. So that's where this two here is where that two comes from. It's the fact that each one molecule, each parent molecule, so this whole thing right here, each one of those has two of those little active moieties of omeprazole. So that's why I'm going to multiply by two millimoles of the active moiety as omeprazole for every one millimole of the parent compound ezomeprazole magnesium trihydrate. So now that cancels these units, and now I'm in just the millimoles of ezomeprazole, which is what I wanted. So the final answer there is 3.48 millimoles of ezomeprazole. Okay? Next one says, well, let's, you just counted ezomeprazole. Go ahead and count magnesium, but remember, we don't just care about the total number of magnesiums. Tell me how much chemical activity there is. Tell me the melee equivalence of magnesium. All right, so I'll try to go through this a little bit faster because, again, this part here, all the way up through this part here, is exactly the same. Would you agree? We're doing the same exact thing as we are right here, okay? What are we doing? We're taking the 30 packets times its weight of 44.5 and then dividing it by the molecular weight of the parent compound to come up with the number of molecules. We're in the number of millimoles of EMT. Now what I want to do, instead of counting ezomeprazoles, I need to count magnesiums. So remember, there was two ezomeprazoles here, but there's only one magnesium. So the one magnesium gets put here for the one EMT molecule. So there's only one magnesium for one EMT, unlike the two ezomeprazoles. So that's why it's one millimole of magnesium for one millimole of EMT. Now the EMTs cancel, and I'm now in the number of my magnesium molecules. But I wanted not millimoles, I wanted milliequivalents. So let's take the chemical activity, the valence on the magnesium, which is two. So I multiply by two milliequivalents of magnesium for every one millimole. So millimoles, number of molecules cancel, and I get my final answer in the number of milliequivalents of magnesium. Okay? 
Let's do some miliosmoles, man. They're all related. I hope that you see a lot of this is the same, but the miliosmoles will be different at the end. So the question says, each packet is to be mixed with 15 milliliters of water. What is the osmolarity of the suspension in milliosmoles per liter? Once again, we are talking about, well, I'll use a different color here. We want the amount per liter. So where we start this question is, well, if I had 1,000 milliliters, how many milliosmoles would I have? Let's start with 1,000 milliliters. All right. Well, if I had that volume, what's multiplied by its concentration? Because we know that there is 44.5 milligrams to be mixed in 15 milliliters of water. So that's where that concentration comes from. By taking 1,000 mils times the amount of weight I'd have per 15 mils, I can determine the concentration, the amount of EMT I would have if I had 1,000 mils. All right. That's a weight. I need to get rid of my milligram weight by converting it to millimoles by dividing by the molecular weight. So that's why I do that. I'm now in millimoles, so my weight is now canceled. I'm now in molecules. Now, take a deep breath. We have molecules again, right? We're good with millimoles, the number of molecules. How many particles? When we take this chemical structure up above here, and I made a mess again. I take this chemical structure up here and dissolve it in water. How many particles will I get out of it? Do I care about the three water molecules? No, I want particles in water, so don't mess with the water. How many magnesiums? One. How many azomeprazoles? Two. One plus two is three. So that's why down here I'm going to say there are three milliosmoles for every one millimole of EMTs because there are three particles that dissociate and that float around in the water. All right, A magnesium and two azomeprazoles, three things. So if I multiply my answer by three here, again, my millimoles cancel and I'd be in milliosmoles. And these would be the number of milliosmoles I would need for a, a liter. So that's 11.6 milliosmoles per liter would be the osmolarity of that solution. Okay. You're not looking entertained. I'm trying to use, I've used like three colors today. That's like a thing for me, right? I've never used that many colors before ever. So I'm trying here. So, all right, so bear with me. All right. This is an interesting one. And again, this is one where I'll perk up the, the people who really know what you're doing here at the end. Let's see if you can catch kind of a mistake. I'm going to do it right-ish and for everyone else. But if you're really good, let's see if you can kind of figure out why it's an ish at the end and not exactly right. All right. So it says, how many milliliters of sodium acetate at a concentration of 16.4% weight per volume would you need to add? So that's the additive, sodium acetate at the 16.4%. We're going to add some of that to a liter. I already have 1,000 mils of a solution that's 0.45% sodium chloride. Let me ask you, is 0.45% isotonic? You know, hopefully you know this by now. Isotonic sodium chloride is what percent? 0.9%. So 0.9% would be isotonic. So clearly 0.45% is hypotonic. So the question is basically saying, add more sodium acetate so that you get enough sodium in there to make your one liter, it says, and I'll just emphasize this for the smart people here, nearly isotonic. Okay, I'll come back to that term. But we're going to try to make this isotonic. We want to make our 0.45% sodium chloride isotonic using sodium acetate. All right, that's what the question is asking. So where do you start? I would still say you need to start by finding your target. Where do we need to be to begin with? So I would argue, well, let's start with our leader solution. If it was isotonic, how many milliequivalents of sodium would I have to have? What would be isotonic? What is the number of milliequivalents of sodium that's the same as isotonic? So let's start with a liter, since I'm going to be trying to make a liter here. If we just said an isotonic concentration is 0.9%, that's essentially 0.9 grams per 100 mils, mils cancel. Would you agree so far? That would be the weight of sodium chloride. That would make one liter isotonic. All we've done is determine the weight. So all we've got to do now is convert the weight of that sodium chloride to the number of milliequivalents. You know how to do this. Let's convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Let's convert the weight of the sodium chloride to the number of molecules, count molecules of sodium chloride, by dividing by the formula weight. Now I'm in the number of molecules of sodium chloride. Remember, I want to know how much sodium is needed. So again, if there's one sodium in every one molecule of sodium chloride, then there's one millimole of sodium for one millimole of sodium chloride. Now, what's the valence on sodium? It's one. 
So we use one milli equivalent for every one millimole, so millimoles cancel. If you multiply that across, would you agree you need 154 milli equivalents of sodium to make a one liter solution isotonic? That's all we've answered. That's our target. So now what we can do is what do we have? We have 0.45% sodium chloride. And I'm going the long way. If some of you are very intuitive and can make jump, faster jumps than I'm going, I'm trying to do it the long procedural, get used to how to cancel your units way of doing this. So let's figure out how many male equivalents are in my 0.45%. I've got a liter of that. Here's my concentration. 0.45% means 0.45 grams per 100 mils. That cancels my volume there, so I'm in the weight of sodium chloride. Again, convert that to uh, milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Convert the weight to the number of molecules by dividing by the formula weight. And lastly, again, there's one sodium chloride, one sodium for every one sodium chloride. And lastly, the valence on sodium is one. So again, one mole equivalent for one millimole. Multiply that across, and we see that 0.45% has 77 milli equivalents. We need 154. How many do we have in our solution already? 77. So what do we still need to get? Let's just subtract. So again, the amount that we have in the we need, our target is 154. The amount that we already have is 77. So clearly what we still need to get is an additional 77. So if we add 77 milli equivalents of sodium from another source, that would make our 0.45% concentration of sodium chloride isotonic. So let's use our sodium acetate. We now have a target. What, how much sodium acetate do we need? We need the amount of sodium acetate that provides us what? 77 mL equivalents. So let's start with that. That's our target. So if that's what I need, 77 mL equivalents, let's work backwards. All right? How do I convert mL equivalents to millimoles? by, again, using the fact that the charge on sodium is one, so there's one mole equivalent for every one millimole. So now mole equivalents cancel, and I'm in millimoles of sodium. All right? But now be careful. We are using sodium acetate. It has a different formula. But I'll still say, how many sodiums are there in a sodium acetate? One. It's Na and then the acetate formula. So there's still only one sodium for every one sodium acetate molecule. So that's why now I can cancel my molecules of sodium and say that I have the equivalent number of molecules of sodium acetate. I can now convert that to a weight by multiplying by its formula weight. So the formula weight is 82. So I multiply that now so my molecules get converted to a weight. I'm now in milligrams, though, of weight. So let's convert the milligrams to grams by simply dividing by 1,000 so that milligrams cancel, and now I'm in grams. And lastly, I can finally use the actual concentration of the sodium acetate bottle that I have. I have a 16.4% weight per volume, which means 16.4 grams per 100 mils, and I put grams on the bottom so that the grams cancel. And if you multiply that across, you would get a total volume of 38.5 milliliters. And that is the final answer. That is the right answer. If we add 38.5 milliliters to our liter bag of 0.45% sodium chloride, would we have enough sodium chloride to make it isotonic? Nearly isotonic. Is everyone okay with the math so far? And I did this the long way. I know you could have made some jumps to show you all the conversions. You should be able to go from any value to any value step by step by step. So hopefully that was okay. Now, just speaking to some of the, the people who are a little bit further ahead, it's not quite right. It's not isotonic. Would you agree? That is the right number of mole equivalents. 154 mole equivalents of sodium makes 1,000 milliliters isotonic. But in the end, will we have 1,000 milliliters? No, we're going to have how much? 1,038.5. Don't forget the additional volume that we're adding. As we add the sodium, we'll change. So our volume is growing. So you can't actually answer this question. If you absolutely hate to make the entire solution isotonic, you can't answer it this way. This is chapter 15. That's just like a couple of lectures away. Are you ready? So we are going to do this in a couple of weeks. The same sort of thing. It's, a, it's an allegation alternative, or you can use this using algebra, where you say that the C times the Q, the, the concentration times the quantity of one, plus the concentration of the quantity of the other, equals some third concentration of a quantity. We will be able to answer this question here in a little bit. If anyone wants to know what it absolutely would be, I can tell you that after class if anyone wants to know if you're that big of a nerd. Anyways, let's move on. All right? You will be able to do that, though, in a couple of weeks. 
I love this question. It goes to show you how difficult and confusing things are. It, looks, it says potassium phosphates. Why is it plural? Does anyone know why it's plural phosphates and not just potassium phosphate? It turns out there's two different forms of the potassium phosphate in there. It doesn't tell you that. It's a USP, so it's, it's a defined formula. So essentially potassium phosphates for injection USP contain essentially a certain percent of, and let me just say it, it contains 22.4% monobasic potassium phosphate, which is KH2PO4. Okay, and 23.6% of the dibasic potassium phosphate, which has a different formula. It's K2HPO4. Okay, so there are actually two different combinations a certain percent of the monobasic potassium phosphate and a certain concentration of the dibasic potassium phosphate. All that's lumped together into one solution. And this is an IV product that's never just injected by itself. You use to take a little bit of it out and to put it into a TPN. Total parenteral nutrition. It's when somebody is getting their entire nutrition from an IV bag. Part of what they need on a daily basis is a certain amount of phosphate. So this is what you put in TPN bags to give the patient the amount of phosphate they need. So having said that, let's use that product and answer these questions. It says, what is the concentration of phosphate in millimoles per milliliter in this solution? Okay. Now when I say phosphate, do I care whether it comes from the potassium or the monobasic or the dibasic? I don't care. From any source, count up the total number of phosphates. All right. So we're going to have to do this one step at a time, though, because I'm going to get a certain number of phosphates from my monobasic, and I'm going to get a certain amount of phosphate from my dibasic. So we got to do them separately. Which one do you want to do first? Yeah, like I was going to give you a choice. But anyways, let's do the monobasic. Are you ready? That's as good as anything else. Let's do the monobasic first. What was the percent I said for the monobasic? 22.4%, right? That's right there. That should not be mind rending. I have 22.4 grams for every 100 milliliters. All right. So it wants to know the concentration in millimoles per mil. Well, I actually have mils here on the bottom. So I won't divide it out until the very end, but I have milliliters. I don't want to cancel milliliters. I'll have it in milliliters. But now I need to go from what? Grams to where? Millimoles. So this is simply just a unit conversion. We need to convert our 22.4 grams to an equivalent number of millimoles and then divide it by 100 to get the amount per mil. All right, so let's convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Now I'm in milligrams. Hopefully you realize now, we got to be careful, this is the monobasic. So the molecular weight for the monobasic was 136.009. So we're going to divide by that number so that my milligrams cancel and I'm now in the number of millimoles of the monobasic. Okay. The last step, though, is it did want the concentration of the phosphate, not the potassium, but of the phosphate. So what you need to understand, though, is that, well, there you go. So I'll just say that right here, if you look right here in the formula, there is one phosphate molecule in a monobasic potassium phosphate. So there's one phosphate total out of one molecule. So again, these will cancel, and that would give me just the number of molecules of my phosphate. So if I do that math across, I'd get 1.65 millimoles per mil. And remember, I do need, don't forget to divide by the 100 mils. So we've got this value here. It doesn't cancel. But you do the math, do the math all the way across, and you would get 1.65 millimoles per milliliter. All right? You ready to do the same thing for the dibasic? So let's set it up. What was the percent for the dibasic? Oh, I wanted a different color, dude. Here's my 23.6 for the dibasic. So coming down here, there's where my dibasic percent comes from. But you'll notice I set it up exactly the same, but I start with a different concentration. And don't forget, I'll have a different molecular weight. So again, the molecular weight that I'm going to divide more is different for the dibasic. But otherwise, it sets up the same. My grams cancel, milligrams cancel, convert to millimoles. And again, there is still just one phosphate. There's only one phosphate in that formula. So that's why there's one there for every one parent molecule. And you get 1.35 millimoles per milliliter. So to answer the question, all you need to do is add them up. We got the 1.65 from the monobasic and the 1.35 from the dibasic. That's the amount of phosphate in millimoles per mil from the two different sources. Add them together, and the total is 3 millimoles per milliliter. All right. Did you notice that we answered and matched the value up on top there? So we get the same answer they did up on top. And that's where it came from. Okie dokie. 
All right, that was the phosphate, but dude, we can't forget about the potassium. It would make it feel bad. So let's do the potassium, all right? But we're going to measure potassium in milliequivalents. So let's determine how many milliequivalents total there are in this entire 50 mil bottle, okay? Instead of doing it per mil, we'll do it per the total 50 mil bottle, all right? Once again, you're going to have to do those one at a time. So to count the milliequivalents of potassium, they won't be the same from the dibasic and the monobasic. So the amount, we're going to start at the same place. We are starting from our 50 mil bottle. So let's again, starting with the monobasic, here's the concentration for the monobasic. So that will convert from that volume to a certain weight. We'll convert the grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Again, the molecular weight for the monobasic was there, so that's where that comes from. So I'll convert milligrams to the number of molecules by dividing by its molecular weight. Okay? Now, let's be careful here. If you look at the formula, so I'll use this formula here, there is one potassium in every one molecule of potassium or the monobasic the potassium phosphate, okay, just one potassium. So one millimole of potassium for every one millimole of pota monobasic potassium phosphate. Now I'm in potassium. The last thing to do is to express it in milliequivalents is to look at the valence. Since the potassium on valence is one, there's one milliequivalent per millimole. Millimoles cancel, and I get the number of milliequivalents of potassium from the monobasic. Okie dokie. Let's do the same thing now for the, the dibasic. This is, again, starting there. Oh, this is turning to blue, man. There's my 50 mils, but again, it has a different concentration, so there's the different concentration. It has a different molecular weight, so that's why there's a different molecular weight. But here's what's important. Let's look at this step right here. This is super important here to make sure you understand this. This one is not the same as the one above. Why is the dibasic different than the monobasic? Because look at the formula. How many potassiums are there in one molecule of dibasic potassium phosphate? There's two. There's two potassiums. So you got to have two millimoles of potassium for every one millimole of dibasic potassium phosphate. And it comes straight off the formula. Now let's take a minute, a minute to reflect on that. Are we okay? This is, a, this is the trick part, I mean, between all of these now. Remember, the dibasic potassium phosphate has K2HPO4. So when we go from the molecules of the parent molecule to just the number of potassium molecules, there will be twice the number of potassium molecules because there are two potassiums from every molecule. Okay. Now the rest of this is the same. The valence is still one, so you're going to multiply by one milliequivalent of potassium for every one millimole. That will cancel, and your final answer there would be 135.5 milliequivalents of potassium. And again, the total doesn't really care where they came from, so if you just add them all up together, you get a total of 217.8, which is about the same. They rounded, I think, on theirs, but you can see they had 220, and we got 218. So that's where I think our answer is just fine. Questions on that? All right, well, we couldn't not do osmolarity here, man, so let's do the total osmolarity of the solution. And I'll speed this up just a little bit, just so you can kind of see everything at once, all right? Osmolarity, because they work very similar, is the amount per liter. So let's start with 1,000 milliliters, okay? Then we're going to need to count particles. You count particles by first determining the weight of your potassium phosphate, whether it's monobasic or dibasic, depending on which line you're at. We use the concentration in grams per mil so that milliliters cancel. Then we convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Then we convert milligrams to millimoles by, again, dividing by the molecular weight. And again, this is where it will be different between the two different forms, all right? But the procedure is exactly the same. Now, Take a minute here. This is what I want to emphasize. This section here is going to be different between those two when we talk about milliosmoles. You have to look at the formula. And this is where it's a little bit tricky because the monobasic potassium phosphate is KHPO4. However, in solution, the potassium comes off, but it's called monobasic phosphate because the hydrogen stays on to the phosphate. It doesn't come apart. So it's not a separate molecule. The hydrogen stays glued onto the phosphate. So you get one potassium and you get one H2PO4. Okay? The hydrogens don't come apart. So there are essentially two particles in this formula right here. Two particles. K and H2PO4. Same thing to some extent down here below, but I will warn you down here, even though the HPO4 stays together, you have two potassiums. So if you have two potassiums and one 
HPO4, then you have H, I'm sorry, potassium plus potassium plus HPO4 gives you three particles. So that's why we're multiplying this one by three. That would have been the big trick to this question here, if you will, in terms of counting up the osmolarity. So you're going to multiply the dibasic by three, since it's got two potassiums and one phosphate, and the monobasic by two, since it's got one potassium with one phosphate. Multiply that across, and you get these final values here. Lastly, just add them up, and you get a total value. So the final answer would be 7,357 milliosmolar. Doesn't that seem really high compared to some of the things we did before when we were talking about iso, osmotic, and everything else? That is super high. Look at this. What does that say right here? Remember, I said this is an additive that would never just be injected. This is never intended to be given to a person. It's intended to use a small amount of it in a big, huge, two to three liter bag of a TPN. So it's only ever intended to be used in a very diluted solution. So it's okay that it has, in a sense, as an additive, that higher concentration, because it's clearly going to be something that's further diluted. All right? Last question here is a, let's just kind of go through, for, I'm running out of time a little bit. It says a medication cassette is prepared with 8 grams of carbenicillin diluted to 250 mils. So we have 8 grams in a total of 250 mils of half normal saline or 0.45% sodium chloride. It's going to deliver a 2 gram dose over an hour and then stop. It doesn't run continuously. Pumps it in for over an hour and then stops and in that hour it gives 2 grams and then it will give another dose in 6 hours. All right, so first question is how many particles and what is the valence? We've got two things in there. We've got carbenicillin, disodium, and sodium chloride. So I just wanted to, just this as a last question, or overall review between when we're doing difference between milliequivalents, which is valence, and milliosmoles, which is particles. You've got to be able to count valence and particles, all right? So I chose the sodium chloride because it's an easy example. When it breaks off, you get two things. You get a sodium and you get a chloride. So how many particles are there? Two. The valence, what's the charge on sodium? One. What's the charge on chloride? One. So the valence is one. All right. Lastly, what's a little more confusing is the carbenicillin disodium. This thing right here, this big old ugly molecule right here, is a carbenicillin molecule. Okay? But you'll notice the oxygens on either side are polarized. They're negative. So because of that, to formulate it, they include how many sodiums? Two sodiums, one on each end of the molecule because there are two negative charges. Carbenicillin has a negative two valence, okay? Therefore, it needs two sodiums. Therefore, if you count the number of particles, there's one, two, three particles. That's where the number of particles would come from in carbenicillin disodium, disodium, two sodiums, one carbenicillin, but the valence is going to be two, okay? Because there's two plus ones or two, one minus two. So that's why the valence is two. All right. How many milliequivalents of sodium would be present in this solution? And I'm trying to do this for time. Uh, let's start. Well, okay. If we want to know the total number of sodium, would you agree there's going to be sodium from the carbenicillin disodium and there's sodium from the sodium chloride liquid? All right. So we have to do these separately. So if I show you the work there for the carbenicillin, I do four doses a day because every six hours is how many doses per day? Four. So that's where that comes from. Okay, it's a two gram dose every time you give a dose, all right? So we have four doses that are each two grams each, so that's eight grams. Let's convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by a thousand. Here's the molecular weight of the carbenicillin disodium there, so let's convert milligrams to the number of molecules. And again, now we're in the molecules of the carbenicillin disodium. How many molecules are in there? Two sodiums for every one carbenicillin molecule. So we multiply by two millimoles of sodium per one carbenicillin. The valence on sodium is one, so it's one milliequivalent per millimole. Millimoles cancel, and that would be the amount of sodium from just the carbenicillin. Okay? This is a little more challenging here for the liquid, and the only sense is where it starts with, because here's the deal. After this point, it's all going to be the same. So once we get from here, it's all going to be the same, but this is it's a little bit different. You still have four doses per day. There's still two gram doses, so this part here is the same as what was up there. What's different is I need to convert from my weight of carbenicillin to the volume of sodium chloride that's going to be administered to give that dose. You see the difference there a little bit? Before we just went from the weight of our carbenicillin, now we have to use this information right here to convert from the weight of a carbenicillin to the volume. Well, where did that come from? Well, we were putting 8 grams of carbenicillin in 250 milliliters. So it comes from these two things right there. Okay, 
So that's what makes this sodium chloride a little more difficult, is I have to take from my weight of carbenicillin and first convert it to the volume of sodium chloride. Then I can use the concentration of the sodium chloride to convert that volume to the weight of sodium chloride. So 200, that volume times 0.45 grams per 100 mils, since it's 0.45%. Now I finally have the weight of sodium chloride. Just like up here, I had the weight of my carbenicillin. Now it works very much the same. The biggest difference obviously being the molecular weight, so make sure you use the correct molecular weight there, but it converts over to the final number of mole equivalents, but that was just from the sodium chloride, so remember to add up the amount you get from the carbenicin plus the amount you get from the, the uh, solution or add it together to get a total of 57.1. And again, for the last part, for the osmolality, remember, osmoles per liter, start with a liter here. This is the concentration of my carbenicillin. It was 8 grams per 250 mils. So those cancel. I'm in the weight of carbenicillin. I convert it to milligrams. I convert milligrams to millimoles. And I'll remind you, why are there 3 milliosmoles for carbenicillin disodium? Because there's how many sodiums? Two, and one carbenicillin is three. So three milliosmoles for every millimole. That's why I multiplied that by three. When we did the sodium chloride, it's the same process. There's its strength to do that. Why did I multiply it by two? Because there's two things. There's two particles, one sodium, one chloride. So that's why that was two. You add those all up together, and you get the total of 381.1. Thanks, guys.